So I'd like to move on now to the second part of my talk, uh, giving an example of how we may use the Genome Browser. So if you're not convinced yet, you get to listen to me for about another 15 minutes in the hopes that we can bring everyone on board. So, as I mentioned, how can the Tomato Genome Browser help me? So, as an example, we're going to look at finding markers associated with bacterial spot resistance. And I've just shown you an image of the Genome Browser and of lines in the field that were both uh, susceptible and resistant to bacterial spot. So, as I mentioned in the first part of this talk, we have information from multiple databases and data sources combined in our browser. And we want to use the browser to say, what does our genome look like around, say, a marker, an EST, or a back? And this can be a tool to help us guide further research. For example, we may be able to use it to identify candidate genes or identify pot potential molecular markers that we could use. So the example I've chosen is one from a, a paper published by uh, uh, Matthew Robbins when he was with David Francis's group at Ohio State University. So it was known that PI-128-216 confers uh, resistance to bacterial spot race T3. And they were, in this paper, they mapped the resistance to chromosome 11. You can see here our, the location of Rx4. And we have this um, SNP marker, SL20181, um, that was located in a unigene on SGN. So the question is, how can we use the genome browser to help us find more molecular markers? Maybe we want to find map this gene, or we want to try to um, find a marker that will be suitable for marker-assisted selection. So, Step one, we've got sort of the top area of our genome browser here. And we're going to type our unigene into the search box. And then we want to, as our data source in this case, we're going to look at the annotated genome. So it says uh, ITAG1 release genomic annotations. We want to select which tracks or which types of data we'd like to view. And then we're going to do our search. So in this case, I selected just to look at the molecular markers on SGN and also our ESTs from GenBank. So we come up with this hopefully not so scary looking um, screen of our genome browser here. And the first thing that I like to do is I like to help orient myself with my scales. So up here, you can see this is our large scale. Um, it's got sort of the largest, um, or it's our scaffold here. We've got a medium scale, which shows um, in more detail what we're looking at in terms of our physical distance. And then we can go down here on our, on our smaller scale. And just for your reference point, this is our unigene, and it's highlighted in yellow. And you can actually turn that off if you don't want to see it, just using the clear highlighting um, function at the bottom of our screen. So the next thing I did was use the zoom tool so that we could zoom out and see what is around our unigene here. And so at this point, I'm showing 6.94 kb. But if we look at our next slide, I've zoomed out to now look at 289.9 kb. And the only reason, that, that was an arbitrary amount to zoom out here. The reason I chose that level was that so that we could see the names of all of our markers down here. Um, so you could still see the names to give an idea of what we're looking at. So once again, we've got our unigene. And there are 22 potential molecular markers that we may be able to use. So the next thing I did was just select one of our markers. In this case, I selected SSR 406. And I just clicked on the marker. 
and it brought up a screen that has more detail. And so now I want to look at our marker on SGN. So I just clicked on uh, the SGN dash M1079 link and it brings me to our soul genomics network and I can locate primers now for our marker as well as a predicted size and we can also see that our marker was derived from this EST. So that's great we have a marker we have primers um, but for anyone who has ever tried to survey molecular markers for polymorphism we know that that's a very key step. So we may want to try to do things to help increase the chance that our marker may actually be polymorphic in our population before we um, before we just go ahead and start surveying. So there are a lot of markers out there but we want to decide which ones would potentially be most useful for us. So one way that I chose to do this here was to use the BLAST function just within SGN or the basic local alignment search tool to look for sequence differences. And this may give us an indication of the likelihood of polymorphism. So I just went to our EST read and we can get the sequence here and I just right on SGN I just clicked BLAST. So in this case I didn't go to NCBI or anything like that. Um, I just worked right within the SGN platform. And the next screen that came up after I clicked BLAST um, was my sequence and it's now um, in a format for blasting and I chose blast n to look um, compare nucleotides and one thing that you want to consider is what do you want to blast against so we can see in this slide that there are a lot of options even just within SGN of what we want to look at so in this case I chose to look at lycopersicum mRNA and so I performed that BLAST search and looked at something called a conservativeness histogram. And that's basically this image down here. And it shows us wherever it's green, it means our sequences are the same. And wherever it's blue, it means that there is a, a difference in the DNA sequence. And we can see here that our EST is pretty highly conserved. Um, and as David mentioned, one of the things that you need to be aware of is also that there are there can be errors um, due to the, the sequencing within any, any particular EST. And we see here that all of the differences are sort of coming at this three prime end. So we know that unfortunately, in our case, our EST is highly conserved. And if we were to look at the actual black um, look at the sequence from the BLAST output, we would see here that we don't have any mismatches here. So unfortunately, it doesn't provide us evidence for marker polymorphism. But, um, you know, the hope is that this wouldn't be the case for all of our markers. Um, and that this can help us to, if nothing else, um, potentially avoid spending time and money that we don't need to be spending. So in conclusion, what did we learn today? So we learned how to use the Tomato Genome Browser to identify molecular markers that might be useful in fine mapping and marker-assisted selection. And one thing that's very important to remember is that the browser is always a work in progress. So as new sequence information is being generated, that information in time is also going to be incorporated into our Genome Browser. And it makes it important so that you understand sort of the structure of the browser so that when things change, it's not overwhelming for you. And you can still get um, your basic orientation in terms of something like the scales, which is not going to change. And finally, that's the end of my presentation. Are there any questions?